Hey everyone, welcome to Season 2, Episode 2 of the Stone and Straw Podcast. I'm your host, John Cullen. You can follow us on Twitter at Stone Straw Pod. As always, the podcast is presented by Curling Zone, Dynasty Curling, and Hardline Curling. This episode is a request from some people. I, I had some people on Twitter who were requesting an American guest on the show, and obviously one of my chief contributors to the show is uh, is a good friend of mine, Matt Sussman, the curling writer for Deadspin. He's like, John, you got to get an American guest on the show. And me being a Canadian got the closest Canadian-American I could find. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Jamie Sinclair uh, is a, a bit of a, I wouldn't say polarizing figure, but certainly people... Uh, have a lot of questions about her background, having been born in Alaska uh, and then playing for Canada as a junior and then as, as an adult playing for the States. And she's obviously blossomed into one of the game's uh, brightest young talents. And so it was great to sit down with her and uh, and get a little bit of an insight into her curling career. I think it's interesting to contrast sort of her journey with Nicholas's from last week, right? Because we talked with Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas Adine, if you haven't listened, go back and listen to that. That was episode one of this season. And Jamie's a professional curler as well. She's being funded by the government as well. Um, And so it's a little bit of an interesting contrast to sort of see what professional curling looks like in the USA compared to Sweden. And Jamie was super forthcoming about all of that. Talks a lot about her journey from, yeah, being born in Alaska to living in Ottawa to then playing uh, for the States and to losing the Olympic trials final. And, And we get into lots of stuff. So it's a great episode. I know that you guys were loving the short intro from last week, so I'm going to keep that rolling with this week. No one really cares about what I have to say anyway. It's not like I'm throwing out opinions here. Hey, here's an opinion. The Continental Cup is boring to watch. There. There you go. Now you have an opinion from me. It's boring. I mean, I'm sure it's great to go and see it live, but who boy, is it ever tough to watch on TV. Anyway, do not at me about that. Do not ask me any questions about that. That is just my opinion, and I it, I think it's shared by some other people as well. But Jamie Sinclair, she's playing in it right now. Canada uh, and the US are trying to come back on the world. But man, it looks like the world's finally going to end their drought. So that's exciting. Anyway, uh, let's get to this episode. This is Jamie Sinclair, one of the skips in the USA's high performance program. Excellent curler, excellent person. I know you guys are going to love this one. So enjoy. Here's Jamie Sinclair. This episode is brought to you by Hardline Curling Supplies, and I'm happy that it is brought by Hardline uh, Curling Supplies because I'm a Hardline Nation member. I've been, my team's been using Hardline for the last five years. We were onto Hardline products before they were even on Dragon's Den. Can you believe that? Ice Pad, it's the most technologically advanced brush on the market. You don't believe me? Seven of the top nine men's teams and 10 of the top 15 women's teams in the world are all using this brush. Kevin Cooey, Brad Gushu, Nicholas Adine, Anna Hasselborg, Reed Carruthers, Chelsea Carey, Mike McEwen, the list goes on and on. And they're great for the rec curler too. Don't just think, oh, I club curl. It's not good enough for me. It's phenomenal for you. It helps with your shoulders. You can use it for over 100 games when your head wears out. You just throw it in the wash and you can use it again. It saves you money. It helps the environment. And they got a lot of great products too. They've got the best pants. Are you one of those cold curlers who's always complaining about how you're cold? Well, guess what? They've got super comfy and warm pants. They've got great shoes, shirts, helmets, broom bags, whatever you need. And if you were looking for that best delivery aid on the planet, that's Reed Carruthers Pro Slide, which you can get exclusively from Hardline Curling. It's guaranteed for life. Your one-stop shop for all your curling need. So visit Hardline at www.hardlinecurling.com or go to any one of the 120 Hardline retailers around the world and get your products today. Um, Okay. So I start every interview by just asking a very simple question. How did you get started in curling? (laughs) Uh, I got started because my dad, Uh, his dad played. So it was just something that was part of his side of the family. And uh, he decided to put my brothers and I into the sport. We were pretty young. It was when we first moved to to Manatic. So uh, I was about nine years old. Okay. And uh, I always make the joke, like, I'm pretty sure if you put two kids into the sport, you get the third one free. So I just kind of tagged along every Sunday. That's what just what we did, went to the curling club. And uh, for me, the best part was a hot chocolate that you got, especially with those little mini marshmallows on top. That's what I looked Hell forward yeah. to. <laughs> I love it. Because it was so cold out on the ice. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but then, you know, you start playing, you start getting better, start getting competitive. And that's when I 
got pretty hooked. And your dad was like, he's a pretty good curler. Yeah, he played uh, he played juniors quite a bit. Um, and then he kind of took a break when uh, he got his career going. And then he went back to it in uh, seniors, actually, and had a good run there. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, that's, what, that's my plan. My plan yeah, is to get okay. good, but I haven't. I didn't get good to start with. But like my plan is so like you're just seniors. Waiting. Yeah, I'm just waiting, waiting for it prime. out. People are going to retire. <laughs> I'm going to retire, but that's then I'm going to come back. That's exactly. my chance. That's yeah. when I'm. That's when I'm going to shine. I think. Although Smart. I don't know if I want to sweep when I'm like 50. Well, then you just got to skip. <sighs> I'm not very good though. That's well, I'm not with that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> so you okay? So I know like you've talked about your backstory before, and I'm going to try and uh, this podcast we don't we try and avoid all of that, but I do think it's somewhat prescient for the conversation. So you okay. were born in Alaska, correct? And you lived there until you were nine. No, no, okay. I was only about two and a half. Okay, yeah. And my dad moved. was posted on a military exchange there. So okay. They, so yeah, they he traded places long. with a U.S. Army yeah, guy. Yeah. Okay, how does that work? So like, Air if, Force, not Army. okay. So okay, sorry. Very important <laughs> distinction. I think I, I don't want to get in trouble with Mr. Sinclair. So Air Force, if you're listening, Mr. Sinclair, Air Force. Uh, so how does that work? So then, like, if the U.S. goes to war or in that time, is that just, just like I'm going, or like how does it? I f- I'm actually not totally <laughs> sure. Um, I was pretty young, so I don't know. Um, no, but I believe it was just he was helping with uh, training that was happening oh, gotcha, there. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. so just yeah. So he so when you were two and a half, you moved back to Canada. Yes. Yeah, we moved to uh, Northern Quebec for a handful of years, and then to Manitou, and then back to Ontario. And so you got so you have an American passport yeah. by virtue of just being born in exactly, Alaska. and you're yeah. the only one of you in your family. Exactly. That's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That so is, I'm the oddball out. <laughs> you are, no kidding. That's cool, though. It's, I yeah. feel like more parents should do that. That'd be great for me in my comedy career. Like, if I could just have a green card, like, if my parents could oh, yeah. just, you know, hooked they up, and, just hooked up it, in the you States know? Yeah, and then exactly. just made it happen. Come on, guys. <laughs> you gotta you think ahead thinking, for these things. You weren't thinking of my future <laughs> curling career. Um, okay, I so let's... Okay, so that's where it's coming from, and that's good. And I would just... Because we're going to talk about the U.S.-Canada thing, okay. you know. Uh, but... I, this podcast we go all the way back to the start so you okay. started out you had you played with rachel holman to start or kind of mm-hmm. in 2007 canada yep. winter games you win with rachel mm-hmm. and i wanted to ask you a question because i read an interview with you where you said that rachel was your biggest role model in mm-hmm. the sport so first of all why <laughs> <laughs> well um okay so yes i played i was playing juniors uh or not even juniors bantams at the time um i was kind of playing like the third position or even front end um and then i got the call from rachel to like come you know be part of this team to to do the run for the canada winter games i was like oh great opportunity you know like i just want to learn and uh she kind of showed me what it was to to be a skip to be a leader of the team um that kind of uh leadership side of it and it was just really uh, interesting to me i was kind of intrigued uh so she kind of she's the one that kind of uh she doesn't know it but she kind of inspired me <laughs> to be a skip she's gonna know now i'm sure she's listening <laughs> uh yeah at the time i just i thought i was like yeah that's that's kind of what i uh, that's that's what i want to do and so because i was reading that and i'm like Maybe that it seems like almost a little weird in a sense because she's only like a couple of years older than yeah. you. Yeah. So to have a role but model that was that's also like, and you're f- also competing right. against her and stuff too. I was like, <laughs> oh, that's an interesting choice. I mean, I guess you hear it sometimes with like hockey players or whatever. They'll be like, that's my role model. Like I looked up to so and so, and then they're only like four years older than them or whatever. Yeah, I think it was just she was the my introduction into that competitive side of the sport. Um, so she she just taught me a lot. And did you stay like? So after that was over and you kind of took over skipping and stuff like that, I mean, you probably weren't in direct competition with her, at least at the junior level. No, not level. at all. Yeah. So was there ever like turning to her for talking about that? Or anything? No. Or, no okay. <laughs> so it was just like, just that experience of playing with her. leadership Sure, role. sure, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, we played, uh, so Lynn and I played front end for her and Emma. And uh, that was just for the 2007 year because then they were aging up. We were staying back in, in uh, Bantams and they had their other team with uh, Ali Krebzak on there and as And then well. you took, and then you started skipping after so, yeah, that? Yeah, so Lynn and I went to like, we moved up to back end and and got a younger front end to join us. Right. Okay. Based and so, on our experience, you of know, course, all yeah, that, yeah, so. yeah. Uh, I played with Rachel Holman, so uh, <laughs> put that okay. on the resume. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That I would for yeah. sure. Um, so now, because that was the thing I was I was thinking about that. Like, it's 
there's always that moment, I think, for a junior curler where you're like, this is it. I'm doing this now. I'm right. becoming like competitive. Yeah. And so that was kind of it for you. That was it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So I, I talk, I've asked a few people that I've had on this show because I've interviewed some younger people about this. You were had a great junior career, right? I mean, you won the Canada Winter Games. You made it out of Ontario twice, mm-hmm. which is not easy. Mm-hmm. Different teams. Uh, you know, you won the universities. What was the transition like into women's curling for you? Because I feel like there's got to be some expectations when you're making that kind of transition mm-hmm. into the into the women's game. It was, it was kind of a weird time in my life. I was I actually, right after juniors finished i went and studied a year abroad so i took my first year of women's off oh, okay basically and i remember like thinking it's like i hope people don't forget it. like i'm coming back right, yeah. <laughs> i hope i can find a team i hope somebody's gonna want to play with me even though like i've been studying on a beach for a year so <laughs> uh, i was a little bit nervous actually coming into women's curling because i didn't know i didn't really have any prospects i didn't know uh, what was going to happen um but then I was just happy I got a phone call from the U.S. and that kind of opened up a, a new door that I didn't really see was there. Right. And so so then when you so you get that call, you start to play women's. Was there that like, did you put expect? Did you have expectations on yourself or did you think like, OK, I've taken a year off. So that kind of dampens the sort of junior thing because i i just feel like there's such a big there's such a big transition there yeah i agree i felt like there was a pretty big gap i felt like i couldn't really rely on my junior success anymore to get by um so i definitely felt like i had to prove myself again i was definitely really nervous coming into to women's play and did you notice like a big a big shift when you started to play women's because i feel like like i was talking with brendan botcher was a guest on the on this podcast and he was talking about how he feels like the transition to men's curling from junior is bigger than the transition to women's curling from junior. Do you think that that's true? Well, I don't know. I've never played men's. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's hard to say. Like, I would say that uh, the biggest difference that I saw was the uh, the commitment level in juniors. Everybody's trying to juggle, you know, school or work or well, I guess they're still doing that in women's, but uh, some people <laughs> are, you, I guess not yeah. me. So I don't know. <laughs> no, what, what's this work thing? Am I right guys? <laughs> no, I just mean that um, in men's or women's, there are a lot more people that are doing it uh, full time. So the commitment is there. You're traveling a whole lot more. It's costing you more money. You're also winning more money. Um, but just the overall commitment is greater. I would say. Okay. So that, but as far as the actual game goes, you didn't really feel like there was a huge difference or mm, no, I mean, juniors, we would just hit everything. So probably throw more draws in women's, but right. That's about it. Okay. A little bit more accuracy, a little bit more finesse in women's just cause you're. Better. And so is that a big adjustment then to, to, to have to realize like, okay, I got to get good at, throwing draws and get good at the finesse game i can't just bang everything yeah for sure and i think the the biggest adjustment for me was um being comfortable calling those shots right because my instinct was still you know just hit it hit bail yeah because i think juniors in a lot of ways is just an execution game right so if you can out hit the other team you're you're probably gonna gonna win most of the time yeah so that's where the adjustment i guess comes in yeah and like you say it was so was part of it like even seeing the shot definitely yeah. definitely yeah um seeing it um being comfortable calling it and then having the confidence to throw it kind of all three of those yeah put together um okay so let's get into the u.s thing so you talked about you get a phone call from the u.s so what is that conversation like so they just call you like what do they say? Hey, come play for us. Like, what is? Yeah. So it was a phone call from uh, the director of high performance, Derek, and he basically just said that, um, like, he knew I was a dual citizen that he'd been watching for a couple years, and uh, he was wondering if I would be interested in trying out for their high performance program. So the high performance program was a new thing that they were just starting in in the states in order to basically like formulate these dream teams. Um, and get more results on the world stage. So uh, they had this combine where you um, you got tested on a whole bunch of different stuff, you know, on ice skill testing. There was strategy testing, there was personality testing, interview um, to determine like coachability and all that stuff. Uh, so it was quite in depth um, process um, that happened in the summer. And yeah, 
I was like, why not? <laughs> Basically. Sure. Yeah. Might as well try this out. <laughs> yeah. When you were getting quizzed on your coachability, was there like answers where you're kind of freaky? Like, well, oh, was- am I saying the right thing or what's going on? Of course. You're always yeah. second guessing. Right. And I think I was in a little bit of a weird spot because they're like, uh, you know, like how committed, how committed would you be? Like, would you be willing to live here and train here? And I was like, uh, I live in Canada right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Because it was, I was so born in Alaska. It was so soon. I was it's like, basically okay. Canada. I don't know what you want. <laughs> so it was. Yeah, I had to. Yeah, I was like, of course. <laughs> sure, I'll go do this thing, and then you show up on the first day of camp. They're like, okay. We're going to work you to the bone. Yeah, pretty much. And also, here's a bunch of questions about your life. <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Yeah. What's the worst thing you've ever done? Because um, <laughs> I have I, uh, a, a former... A lie detecting test. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No. <laughs> Son of a... Uh, I have a former student who is just got uh, drafted to the Red Wings a couple of years ago, and he just started playing for them this year, and he, we were asking him about that, because that's like famous, like, you know, the yeah. NHL draft yeah. combine. They get asked all those questions, and he was saying that, that that's the one that he heard like it's brought up a lot like what's the worst thing you've ever done and he's like i don't even know like, yeah and when you like, get put on the spot too you yeah. how do you you're like i think i've done some bad stuff but it's I just hard can't remember. it's hard not yeah it's hard not to be like i mean everything i'm not I've used done to is willingly like, sharing that information so everything I've, I've done is pretty good was there a question that really threw you for a loop when you did it do you remember oh i can't even remember the questions yeah I mean, obviously, it worked out. Yeah, <laughs> I you guess must I have, answered whatever them correctly. They were, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the worst thing I ever did was still on the spectrum of acceptable activities. <laughs> don't so even it was worry fine. about it. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, correct me if I'm wrong, but you did a year where you played both, right? Like I American did. and Canadian. Yeah. Okay, so talk me through that because confusing that yeah, seems that very was, confusing to have two was, women's teams who does that it was chaos yeah for two di- <laughs> for two different countries that's what i mean what the hell um yeah so <laughs> probably not the best like i don't recommend it <laughs> probably not the best thing to do okay. um it started off with a um so i was just coming back from south america so i was like oh, i need a team um so i got we put together uh an ontario team and we were gonna play i was still like partly Actually, I was still studying in South America. So I was like, I can't commit to that many events. Like I can play like maybe two, three spiels and then play downs. Um, And then September rolls around and uh, actually Alex Carlson, who is currently on my team, (laughs) uh, she was skipping her own team in the States and she was she had a player like back out last minute from her team so she was really desperate. And then Jerry Gertz was like, well, there's this Canadian that can play for you as well. Um, so she was like, okay, why not? Like, I'm desperate. I need somebody for nationals. So, uh, so she asked me to play and I was like, sure. This was before the call from, uh, the director of high performance. Yeah. Um, so I was like, okay, cool. Like, why not basically compete in the nationals? That'd be, that'd be a good experience. Um, so I did both. (laughs) So I ended up like traveling back and forth from Chile to either Canada or the U S like six times. Sounds like my In that semester. So yeah, it's a pretty long flight. And so how does that (laughs) like, how do you, because I feel like every team has their own kind of like special sauce or their like mix Mm -hmm. that, you know, the chemistry mix and whatever. So how do you, how do you reconcile that? Like how, how do you, how hard was it to adjust to like, okay, this is, this is who I have to be or what I have to do on this team. And this is who I have to be and what I have to do on this team. It, um, it was challenging. Um, and I think the hardest part was because I was playing so few events and because I was just basically flying in for those events and I was, I wasn't pra- like, there's no ice in South America. So I was very much just parachuting in. Um, it, it, it wasn't the best for team dynamics or, you know, building, um, everything that you just mentioned, that kind of, um, relationship in the team. So it wasn't very good good <laughs> don't recommend it um and so I, I probably i feel pretty bad for my teammates because i was just like hey guys hey, showing up i'm gonna curl bye. and then bye did you learn anything from it uh, from playing on two teams that you should sleep on the plane <laughs> <laughs> that's a good it's a good skill to learn i commuted to university for a few years and i learned how to sleep on the bus okay a bus from it was like a hour bus to you, school you gotta do what you gotta do right if you learn how to sleep on a mm-hmm. commuter bus yeah I mean, you can sleep. Golden. You can sleep anywhere. Yeah. So it's good to get that training in for sure. So did you have an inkling? So you kind of said it was 
Jerry set up you playing on this yeah. team? Did you kind of have an inkling that there might be a chance that you would play for the USA at that time? Or was it just kind of a like, ah, whatever? Yeah. Um, at first, I was just kind of like, why not? This this would be fun. Um, and then once I played a couple of events with them, I kind of saw what the field was in, in the States and I saw how it was um, being run and, and everything. And then I was like, oh, maybe this is a good um, stepping stone. This is maybe a good path that I want to go down. So when you, so you get the call, I assume, mm-hmm. so you do this training program yeah. and they choose you. Mm-hmm. Was there ever like, was there soul searching involved in that? Because you had <laughs> played for Canada before. I know my American listeners are going to be like, she's ours. Don't talk about Canada. But yeah. like, did you, was there a moment? Because I assume it would be pretty difficult for you to play for Canada again. Yeah. So was there like a period where you had to be like, oh, do I want to do this or not? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think the biggest thing was, I mean, obviously being American was always a big part of uh, who I am and my family did a really good job of, um, like we always celebrated Canadian and American Thanksgiving. I always had American flags in my room. Like my my parents always made sure that I knew I was American and I was proud to be American. Um, so I always kind of, I had that going for me, which was good. Uh, but the hardest part was, again, I was just kind of like parachuting into the States. They had no idea who I, like a junior curler from, there's so many in Canada. They're like, who is this sure. girl? Where is yeah, she yeah, coming yeah. from? I don't know. You're right. Right. Jamie Sinclair. So That's even weird. how you pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the hardest part was um, just trying to fit in and feeling like I belong and uh, just having faith that, you know, that's that's the path that uh, I was meant to be on and just kind of um, trusting in the process of it all. <laughs> so you never had, did did you ever have like a weird moment? So after you make the decision, did you ever have a weird moment of like putting the USA jacket? Like I know you said I'm American no. or whatever, but was there ever like a weird moment of like, mm, that, no, it, it never felt weird. Um, like saying that I play for the U S or that I'm representing the U S or wearing that American jacket. Uh, like, yes, I always had kind of a dream, um, when I was growing up that I'd be wearing the maple leaf on my back. I never got to do that. But, um, I think that, uh, putting the American flag on was just as, uh, inspiring to me. That's good. Yeah. I, you know, Cause I, I, yeah, it would be so weird. I mean, I'm not a dual citizen, but yeah. I just feel like that would be a tough, a tough thing to have, especially cause you played for a Canadian national yeah. championship and you're so close. Um, so is it, so you go to the U S and was there ever anyone or not anyone, but I, I feel like critics might say, Oh, well, she just went to the USA because, you know, it's the States. Like, right. Did you, did you hear some of that? Did you wear some of that? Yeah. Um, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a touchy subject. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's why we're here. <laughs> um, yeah. There's definitely people that, uh, people have cried on this podcast, Jamie. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I so, promise I won't cry today. You could. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, feel free to like... This Be is, vulnerable, Jamie. This is where you let it out. This is... Stone and straw is the vulnerable place. Um, I've definitely heard, you know, um, it's a cop-out. It's, it's the easier path. It's a shorter route to success. Um, but I would say that, you know, any other sports, people get traded different teams, different countries. Um, and to me, it was just such a good opportunity um, to have funding, to, to have a coaching staff, to have, you know, people looking after you. All you have to do is worry about performing on the ice. Um, all of that stuff was just uh, things that I wouldn't be able to do in Canada. So for me, it was the opportunity, but other people, of course, they're going to see it how they want to see it. And if that's them thinking it's a cop out, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so that doesn't bother you. No. <laughs> I mean, I guess it can't. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Uh, would you ever like, so playing for Canada, is that ever something that you would do again? Is that even possible? I don't know how it works. Um, it would be possible. There's but like, don't you a, have to take like years off. Yeah. Or there's like, like that? a three year rule or something. After you represent one country, you have to wait. Um, so I think it's three years or something uh, in order to play down or represent another country. Uh, so it would be possible. I don't think I ever would. Uh, I've really um, kind of, I've really tried to establish my roots in, in the U S and grow the fan base there. And um, yeah, it's just kind of, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. The you're fan, on out. American. Good. You're in. Yeah. All the, in. Does the, do you ever hear anything from the American fan base about you being Canadian? Like, I feel like I was approaching that question in my mind of mm. like it being Canadians being like, 
oh, that's a cop out or whatever, which I don't, I mean, you know, the men just won the gold medal. So right. the U.S., obviously, the curling program's strong. I'm not trying to say yeah. that. It's a, but did you ever feel like there was any American fans who were like, wow, why do we have this? I mean, she grew up in Canada. What, Like, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, not that I've heard to my face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's always the key, right? <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard anything. I'm sure people, some people think that. But uh, no, I haven't heard anything. Um, I just, the the only thing I would say is that the other like players in the program at the beginning uh it was very much i needed to prove myself because there was this idea like who is who is she basically sure. which is totally understandable and, yeah. and and i think i i did an okay job of doing that but <laughs> <laughs> i would say so too i mean <laughs> but yeah it was very much like um like why do we why do we have a canadian <laughs> so did you cuz yeah cuz i guess theoretically like you know you maybe took someone's spot or right. whatever right so then maybe there is that feeling from at least one person like what the hell yeah you the know? one person that didn't get it <laughs> sorry <laughs> i didn't mean to do that was that something that the program ever addressed like with the players that you know mm, of not that i know of okay so no. it wasn't a big deal it no, was just no, like no, that no. she's here and yeah okay so let's transition into that because we've asked we're talking a lot about canada and i know my american listeners i've specifically yes. have had people be like why haven't you had an American on the yes, show? And Matt Sussman always helps me out. And he's like, get an American on the show. Uh, so you have basically, so you came into the U S program at like a crazy time to come into the U S program with all these changes and everything right. happening. Like you basically were riding shotgun for this completely new program. What was that like? It was really exciting. Um, I think that just, yeah, it, it felt it, honestly, it was probably, it probably helped my transition a little bit because this whole process of high performance program was new to everyone. So it wasn't just new to me coming in from Canada. So everyone was trying to figure out their place. They were trying to figure out like the structure of the organization, the coaching, the teams, everyone was going through this combine process. It wasn't just me trying out. So uh, I think that that all happening at the same time was actually pretty convenient. And I think it helped the transition, which was pretty cool. Did so that so the high performance program happens and then you basically get put with a team. Yeah. So they select so, you you uh qualify or you make the national team in general as sure. an individual and then they'll put you on a team based on like what like your strengths as a shooter, yeah, your sure. your preference, your strategy knowledge, all of that. And so was that Talk me through the first year of that, because I'm sure you'd never been through something like that before. Very weird. Yeah. You're used to just playing with your buddies <laughs> that, yeah. are, that live close to you. Right. Uh, that's kind of what they do in Canada. So uh, totally new um, process. It was pretty cool to uh, to be on a team that was like minded. You know, they had the same goals, same commitment and everything. My first year I was playing third for Nina Roth. Yeah. And um, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. So. I, I thought that that was I thought that was pretty good. Obviously, I've skip is kind of my jam, so <laughs> that, that's where I wanted to go. Yeah, but I was definitely okay playing third my first year because I was like, "Hi, my name hey. is Jamie." Yeah, yeah, sure, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so I was okay playing third. Uh, I just wanted to be part of the program and learn as much as I could. So that was fun. I got to do some sweeping, which I'm terrible at. That's okay. Uh, that's, you're a born skip. I don't think I've ever seen a skip where I'm like, well, that's a good sweep. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's very rare. That's okay. That's okay. I'm not, you're good at shot making. I'm good at sweeping. You know, we just mixed doubles team. I, if you want to, right. I mean, I've thrown out a few, I, <laughs> I've, I've been not so shy about just using this podcast as like leverage to get on future teams. You know, that's what happens when you curl in BC. You probably feel it a little bit curling in America. You come back to Canada. People are like, who's the American teams? I don't know. They have a US mm -hmm. flag on whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's like curling in BC, BC is like the same. People are like, what? These guys, are they good? Or they, what's going on? They, they're, they're here now. I don't know how this happened. Um, so they say like you can't teach chemistry. So mm -hmm. how... So when you first get put with that first team, what are the steps that you take that, that, that the program goes through to try and build some of that up? Because I feel like, especially for you being brand new in the States, you're with a new team, you're playing a position you haven't really played. Yeah. How does that work? Uh, huh. it was, um, tell me all of it. I want all the proprietary information. 
it was a little challenging, uh, especially because curling is a small world, uh, especially in the States. There's not that many at, at the top level. Sure. Um, so I did find it was, everybody knew each other. Everybody was friends for, everybody had played together since they were little kids. Um, so it was a little bit clicky. So it was a little bit hard for me to break in. Like on the ice, I thought things were pretty good, but it was off the ice, just making, you know, friends. Yeah, <laughs> Friendship sure. 101. For sure, yeah. No, but <laughs> that's was, important, it was hard. right? It was hard. And I'm used to moving around everywhere with the military and everything. But yeah, it's it's hard to make friends when you're 24. <laughs> um, so I thought that was one of, uh, probably one of the most challenging bits. But the program they we had a great sports psychologist and we did a lot of team sessions together to uh, be vulnerable and um share um a lot of feelings and you know just build that core level of trust which was really helpful and uh we also tried to do the classic team bonding exercises uh, during training camps whenever we could to you know figure out how we work uh, off the ice and a had- lot of escape rooms <laughs> <laughs> I love escape. Rooms. I know, right? That sounds great. It's fun. You're talking about being vulnerable. I'm like, ah, oh, maybe this is maybe I should get hired by USA Curling. We'll just have everyone do a podcast <laughs> Every, all go. at the same time. <laughs> share your deepest, darkest feelings. <laughs> so when did you start to feel was there like a moment or a person or a, a, a spot in time where you're like, okay, now I'm in. I'm here and this is we're we're doing the right thing and and I'm these are my friends now and we're doing it. I think that I got pretty lucky last year with, or two years ago, I guess it was, uh, with the team that I got put on. Um, I I genuinely love everyone on on my team, and I think that that really helped me feel like I belong. You know, like you said, you you build friendships, and then if you're enjoying it, you're gonna have more fun, and you're probably gonna play better and do better, get the results that you want. So um, I was really happy with uh, the girls that that uh were on my team and and it made a big difference as far as it didn't feel like it wasn't it wasn't as challenging like i i just felt like that's what i was meant to do it's where i was meant to be um it was really fun to like i had my own apartment down in the states it it started to feel like home i would have friends over and and it just made that whole process of living in a different country for your job it just made it all easier <laughs> which yeah. is great yeah yeah no that's good made for you sure. miss homeless you know i understand completely yeah Did, so i'm trying to think of what i had a question and now i've lost it sorry so gonna, no, no you don't be sorry <laughs> but then we're we'll just this will be editing magic okay we'll like cut this part out and then it'll be like oh he came up with the genius question oh, right so off, quick <laughs> right off the top of his head he's got it now oh yes okay here we go so do you feel like like how much a part of the process are you? So, so if you, so say you had a teammate that it just wasn't gelling or wasn't oh, clicking I see. or there, or just in general, you're just kind of feeling like, I don't love the thing we're doing. Like how, how much a part of the process are you? At the beginning when this program was just coming about, we didn't have a whole lot of say at all. It was all uh, coaching staff, based they made basically all the decisions as the years have gone on especially after this last year with the results that we got we got a little bit more say which was great i think so <laughs> it's evolved it's over evolving time. Yeah. yeah and do you, and so and i think they had to do that because the program was so new four years ago they they had to be very stern and very strict sure because it was a new program to make it work. Yeah, exactly. And I guess you probably figure out the personalities that you trust as well, yeah. right? Like if you say something as opposed to maybe someone else and you're like, okay, well, yeah. they're, I don't really trust what they're all about. And yeah, 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 no, that makes sense. And so what is that? Like, do they come to you and do they say, Hey, like, what are you thinking? Or is it part, or is there some kind of like <clears throat> feedback loop where you're also providing it when you have it or? Yeah, exactly. Um, they have, so it's it's still pretty structured. We'll have interviews at the beginning of the season and then um, probably middle of the season and then at end of the season. Interviews with all the coaching staff uh, to to share that information, you know, feedback, how we thought, how things are going, um, what we like, what we'd like to change kind of thing. And it's a two-way street, you know, it, same thing from them we're sharing. So um, it, it, 
they're they're i think they're doing the best that they can with the information loop for sure yeah do you so do you feel like the program overall has made you better do you think it's a better way of doing things oh for sure yeah i I don't think i would be where i am without the program at all um i think that them going out and finding me three other girls that uh, are like-minded and you know want to do the same things that that i'm doing that's great i wouldn't have been able to do that on my own because i didn't know anybody (laughs) yeah yeah for sure (laughs) again hi my name is jamie (laughs) well and it's also a big country right (laughs) Right. like a lot of these teams it's not it's not like they're all from minnesota or wisconsin or whatever. yeah we're all over the map so very fortunate for that and then of course the funding and the resources with coaching staff and all that this episode of Stone and Straw is brought to you in part by Dynasty Curling. Dynasty Curling is a Canadian company that has been around since 2015, at changing the landscape of curling apparel both on and off the ice. And my team uses Dynasty. Uh, we're repping the Dynasty clothes out there. They're super comfortable, super nice. And and we're not the only ones who use them. Obviously, Olympic and world champions, Team Jennifer Jones, Team Chelsea Carey, Team Gushu, Team Adine, Team Cooey, and many more. If you follow them on Twitter at Dynasty Curling, you can see they're an insanely good roster. But what a lot of people probably don't know is that Dynasty also creates a lot of curling products for off the ice as well. It could be hats and hoodies that just have the dynasty logo on it which look great they have gear to support your favorite team or your favorite province at the briar or the scotties and they also have workout gear which is really cool too so you should obviously check them out and uh, especially check out that apparel you probably didn't know you probably just think oh it's only this sublimated curling gear i see on the ice no they have awesome off ice stuff and because they're really sweet uh, they have a deal just for you for listening to this podcast. If you use the promo code Stone Straw at checkout, you'll get ten percent off your uh, any purchase you make of Dynasty Off Ice Apparel. So that's pretty amazing. So head on over to DynastyCurling.com, enter in the promo code Stone Straw, and you'll get ten percent off your order of Dynasty Off Ice Apparel. And if you live in Winnipeg, they just opened a retail store, so you can check that out at the Granite Club in Winnipeg, or check them out online at Dynasty Curling on Twitter, Instagram, uh, or dynastycurling.com. So how has it felt to be, because it does feel like curling is a surging product in the Mm -hmm. U.S. I mean, obviously, Schuster's gold medal win helps, but even before that, you had curling night in, you have curling night in America, stuff like that. How does it feel to be a part of that movement i i hate like how do you feel questions but i do think it's like, i feel it's, it is fantastic kind of cool. yeah, right? i love the fact that the sport is growing so much in the states like curling clubs are being built um they have a bunch of arena uh curling clubs all like places that you far south places that you would never imagine a curling club yeah you curl in charlotte what's up Sh- with that well sh- why not charlotte's freaking <laughs> awesome they watched the olympics and then they were like I love this sport. We're going to build a curling club. And then four years later, they had a dedicated curling. They just raised the money in four years and built a dedicated curling facility. And the place is unreal. That's awesome. Like, so you're just what? like, okay, I curl the, out of here those now. Those people <laughs> are the best. Yeah, basically. No, I... <laughs> I'm just a big Hornets fan. Uh... <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I went down. I, I taught a clinic there um, to help the sport grow. And that's back when they were playing on hockey ice. And then... then they they had a uh, grits and granite bond spiel went down there uh played and it was a ton of fun and then yeah once it came time to like pick a curling club to uh play out of in the states i didn't of course i didn't have any ties to any curling clubs um so i, I chose charlotte and so here we are and, and yeah. have they embraced and you as as oh, their yeah. own they oh, must definitely. love it right? they're the best yeah. they are the best do you feel do you feel a responsibility in some ways to help grow the game as well i mean i feel like mm-hmm. all curlers do yep. i think it's part of our game but especially with you being kind of a high profile member of the team is that something that you feel a responsibility <clears throat> to do definitely and it's it's one of my like outside of playing the sport of curling gr- i think growing the sport of, is one of my biggest passions and that's why i that's why i started a youtube channel like back in the day yeah um curl up with jamie yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be a catchy title so you don't forget it <laughs> i didn't i obviously remembered it i mean i i researched also no i'm just kidding yeah no and and uh like the women of curling calendar my my charity was the youth program at charlotte to you know just anything i can i i can't do that much but anything i can do is uh is trying to grow the sport Okay, i want to talk to you about one specific uh thing that grew the sport that was also 
bothersome to me, and I would like your opinion Uh-oh. on it as well. When Broomgate. The, what? Broomgate? No, no. Oh, my God. No, no. That's over. That God. marketing, though, was really good. Who would want to talk about that No, anymore? nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah. But the fact that it was all over. Oh, hell yeah. It was really good for I, curling. I had someone the other day, they were like, so what's going on? Like, curling equipment. They were, they had, I think they had curled in the past, and but they hadn't yeah. in a long time. And I told them that there was a thing called Broomgate. <laughs> and they just thought that that was, like, the greatest. They're like, what? And I was like, yeah, like, the brooms got too good. But, like... <laughs> But it was this weird thing where no one could just talk about it. So yeah. then everyone just had to make their own broom that was more cheating than the other brooms. And they're like, what very, is very going shady. on? Very shady. I'm like, it's so shady. Uh, no, I want to talk to you about a tweet from uh, Barstool Sports. Oh, because, yeah. Because, <laughs> uh, for I mean, okay, I'm going to be, I'll say I'm, a, I'll say I'm a little bit biased in that I'm not a fan of what they are doing over there. But like, do you? How how did you feel about that? Because I felt like on the one hand, so so for those of you that don't know, Barstool Sports, very like broski uh, sports website. One of the co-founders, I think, saw you on Curling Night in America, and he said, uh, "What did he say here? Oh yes, you're uh, so cute and wifey. I can't even stand it." That's the direct quote. Yeah. Uh, and so I just felt like so you like your followers went off after that. Like you got so many followers after that and Curling yeah. got a lot of attention. Does that kind of attention bother you? Like is that a weird cuz like it's pretty sexist. Yeah. So is that kind of a weird part of also you're like, "Ah, oh, we're growing the game, but Yeah, see, it started off very innocent. I believe there was a tweet that just said, "Hi." <laughs> with with an <laughs> with a waving emoji. So, I think I I replied to that tweet with a waving emoji. I mean, what else are you supposed to... I was like, yeah. hi. So it started <laughs> yeah. off very innocent, and I was fine with that. Um, and then, yeah, then it got... It, <laughs> it evolved from there. Yes. Um, there was a lot of emojis in the next tweet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so like you said, it, it's tricky. I think um, growing the sport is good. Uh, I think that um, when there are uh, bigger entities or, you know, any any company for that matter that is um, giving attention to uh, curling is good for the sport, but it depends what kind of attention. Um, I think referring to somebody as wifey isn't uh, necessarily the compliment that I'm looking for. You know, if you're watching me in Curling Night in America, I think it would have been better if if the compliment was uh, regarding performance yeah no was, i mean i'm gonna be <laughs> honest the, the article was all about your looks it yeah, was a lot yeah. of looks things you know yeah um yeah so tricky because then because then i turn around and do a women of curling calendar you know right. so it's like where do you it's hard where do you draw the line well so the the curling calendars feel a little different to me only because they're by curlers true for curlers true. and for charity and for charity yeah so it feels a little bit different yeah but I, but I know what you're saying. But, the, but then those pictures that you're still doing for the calendar are used, are separated from the calendar and used in, in other um, internet things. <laughs> yes. It's challenging being a woman in sport, I feel. Yeah. Is that something yeah. that you feel? Yeah, I, I, I haven't. I, I, I'm like, I feel. How do you feel? <laughs> I feel that being a woman in sport is very challenging. <laughs> yes, fortunately, I haven't had too many uh, of those like difficult uh, experiences. Um, most of most of um, most of it, I feel for me, has been regarding performance. So that's good. But so that's I good. can only imagine what some people have to go through. It's not great. No. I don't think, but. Yeah, like you say, I guess it's on a little bit more of a smaller scale, but it's got to be, it must be a weird thing when you see things like that and you're like, yeah. I don't know, I don't know what to say. What do I do? Right. It's, it's almost those like, you're like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's not. That's less. That, yeah. you like, initially you're like, oh, that's cool. You're getting the attention. Then you're like, oh no, that's not, that's, that's not, not the attention, the attention you I, want. Yeah. Yeah. It's, hmm. Okay. Well, that's all I got on that one. Yeah. I was just like, you know. <laughs> it really i because i remember it happening i was like i was in the moment on yeah. twitter i remember it happening and i remember being like okay same as you kind of like okay this is cool yeah. like a big guy is tweeting about this and then i was like uh. yeah and then i think and then i think he wrote in his article that she just that you turned him off. Me. Yeah, because yeah, I was like, you said it was a modern Nicholas Sparks novel. Oh, <laughs> Dear Jamie, no, <laughs> apparently was the uh, was the big. 
Yeah, because he's. I, I guess he felt like you were playing hard to get because that's how. No, it I works. just didn't want to get it. <laughs> exactly. You're exactly. You're. A, but you're a woman. That's what you're doing. Um, okay, let's go back to the curling. Uh, so you mentioned earlier you first played with uh, Nina Roth, and then yes. you split off, and then she ends up being your biggest rival. So, yes. does playing in the high performance program? kind of foster those rivalries like what is the relationship like with the other teams in the program uh i mm-hmm. well uh, <laughs> how do i say this <laughs> um they definitely try to make you feel like a greater team usa okay like everyone in the program we do a lot of um activities or like training together as a whole program so they they do try to foster that that greater team mentality. Uh, But then again, we are always pitted against each other to, to qualify for events, to, to get sponsors, to, to do anything. Basically it's always head to head. So uh, there's definitely a rivalry there. And um, I think that Nina is a great player and a great skip. And I think that's why, the, our first year in the program playing back end together didn't really work because just because of the personalities. Two skips. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's just two meant to be skips. Um, so I think. And obviously they identified to, that yeah, because so they split you up right we away. Had to split, yeah. Because I feel like in Canada, Canada is really the only country where there's enough curling teams that this becomes exactly. a thing. But in Canada, it's like it's the same thing. We're all competing to be Team Canada, but because we're not kind of under the same umbrella, it still feels like it's a lot easier to be friends, I mm-hmm. guess. Like, so what's the, there must be a challenge there. Like at what point, so you say you want everyone is coming under the banner of Team USA, but at what point does it like split off where you're like, okay, yeah, we're all Team USA, but like also like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I would say like right off the bat. <laughs> for me personally, that's yeah, how okay. I feel. Okay. I think that it's different for some other people. Uh, on in this program because they are really go- good friends and they go back to playing together when they were 12 sure. you know so i think that they maybe have a little bit easier of a time being like yeah we're friends more social um i think it's i i personally have found it a little bit more challenging yeah and because uh, i feel like i would too you yeah. know because <laughs> you're in close proximity with them all the time you're yeah. sharing a lot of the same resources yeah it's got to feel like at some point like oh this is for sure this is a lot is that something that you think will be a future development of, of the high performance program that maybe it's a little less oh i'm not sure a little know. less coupley, I guess, couple-y. is it? not for lack of a better word, but a little less <laughs> yeah, kind yeah, of doing yeah. everything together. Because you said it's evolving. Is that maybe well, where it a good, goes? A good example is in the past couple of years, we've actually kind of had to share coaches too. Right. And this year is the first year that every team has their own coach. Yeah, I saw but they're all over the right? place. There's so many There's of them There's so now. many U.S. So teams I think here. I'm like, who are, <laughs> who are these people? Um, so I think that's a good uh, transition. That's a good uh, way to evolve. Um, and that's definitely made us feel more uh, of a smaller team, more of a unit of within our... thing. Yeah. Do you ever, do you ever worry that... Um, or not worry, but the talent pool in the States, they're, they're really concentrating it. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that... So you're trying to grow the game, but at the same time... It's also a lot of resources behind only a few teams. Yes. There, so there's only three women's teams and three men's teams in the high performance program on like the men's and women's side. And then there, there are a, a few uh, junior teams as well. Yes. They don't get nearly as many um, yeah, they're resources. Kids. They're kids. Who yeah. cares? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. You're fine. No, they... Go to school, junior. <laughs> Just graduate, please. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, but they are trying to to help grow the junior teams as well. It's just, honestly, the U.S. doesn't have that much funding. Right. Uh, and, like, we don't... Honestly, we don't have that many resources, so um, it's pretty uh, thin spread, even within the six men's and women's teams. Yeah. That, unfortunately, I don't think the juniors get nearly as much as they should. Yeah. Um, or any of the grassroots, really. Um, yeah, I wasn't talking so much about juniors, because yeah. I think juniors is its own struggle. I think okay, every junior yeah. team across anywhere... Yeah. You're a junior team. You're never going to get as much funding as a senior yeah. team. It's just never going to happen. Yeah. I, I was talking more about the like mid-level teams. Like it seems like the high performance program is kind of crushes well, those teams. Th- yeah, and actually that's been a that's been a huge debate in in the states is is the high performance program helping 
the overall development of teams or is it just yeah narrowing it down to these are the three teams and that's it basically it's like how would you have a national championship if those you only have basically those three teams so what do you think uh well (laughs) i think that the national the uh high performance program has um generated the results that the u.s has needed like i don't think a u.s team would be doing what they're doing without the high performance program um it does create a bit more of a divide from um a self-funded team to a high performance funded team because of opportunities like because of our funding we can travel and maybe get more points and get more Mm -hmm. experience and whatever um so i think that's 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 probably an issue um but the same kind of thing would be like a lot of canadian teams that are really successful are self-funded oh totally right so i don't think that I think that it's difficult, it's challenging, and um, but I think that if there are American teams that, that want to be the best in the world, that want to compete at the World Curling Tour, I think it's possible. It just requires maybe a little bit of short-term pain, but in the long run, you know, it could definitely be worth it. And because you've also mentioned, so you are not, even being in the high-performance program, you're still trying to secure outside oh, yeah. funding like all the time yeah yeah, yeah. Th- like the funding that we get from the high performance program doesn't cover our season gotcha. we rely on we need sponsors in order to pay for so is that ever an issue in the t- among the teams as well like ah oh, well they got money's it. always an issue well, i know <laughs> it's curling of course money's always an issue but i mean like so say you got a huge sponsorship and then another team in the u.s program didn't get that is there some kind of no actually um i think that we've been pretty good with that so far um like there's there's no like animosity or, an, or anything right. um with that because it's it's mostly most of the sponsorships that we do get are kind of personal connections right um so what can you do exactly you got a yeah. hundred grand from barstool sports i it's wish <laughs> <laughs> i would have replied to the tweet <laughs> donate the team a hundred grand I, so i think uh you're in a unique position to answer this question because you have played on both sides of the border do you see because i think there's a lot of talk in Canada that the residency rules are about to right. maybe dissipate. Do you think that that's a good route to go for Canada? <clears throat> yeah, but then if those disappear, then what happens to the Briar and the Scotties? Well, I don't know, Jamie. That's what I'm asking. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that you need to come up with a plan. I'm just saying like... So listen. <laughs> I'm just saying in your experience, being a high performance yeah. program member of a, of a country that is one of the top 10 yeah. you know, major countries of curling... You know, Canada is the biggest, but the U.S. is not nothing, obviously. Yeah. So do you think that that's a problem, dissolving the residency or, and maybe establishing some type of high performance team? I think that in the past, Canada got away with um, being divided by provinces and, and territories. And you could have these great teams coming from one province or territory. Um, well, province. Well, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> love, to all my, love to all my friends in the Yukon and Northwest Territories. I just couldn't resist the gag. Um, but I think now with the sport growing and um, having these fully dedicated teams in uh, other countries doing so well and doing it full time and really um, elevating their level, I think that in order for Canada to to continue to compete at the highest level and have the best teams in the world, I think that they need to not handicap themselves. Basically, like open up the floodgates so that open you can, up. yeah, so that you can truly have the best Canadian team. Because right now you're you're limiting yourself, and that was okay in the past, and we got away with it. Canada got away with it. Um, <laughs> don't laugh at me. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. You're laughing too. Um, but yeah, I think that if they want to be, the, if they want to have the best team in the world or best team in Canada, you gotta be able to choose. So you're from cheering for them to not do that, but so that they don't the, have the best. The, <laughs> you're like, right. I want an easier so team at the world. Keep those. Yeah. yeah keep, let's get. Everyone has to be from the same, from the same town. city. <laughs> yeah. Same town cannot be more than a hundred thousand people. Everyone moved to Thunder Bay. Yeah, because I love the Briar and the Scotties. Who I think right? it's such a great event and it's so cool to have, you know, people cheering for not a specific team but for uh an area. It's just so good. I know. So I'd be I'd be really sad to see that go. Yeah. I agree. It yeah. would be sad, but I think it's happening. I think there's honestly I think there's going to be a divide between teams that want to play um 
for the Briar. For the nat for a for national championship and the world and teams that want to compete on the world curling tour. Because I guess that kind of happened in the States, right? Like you can win the nationals and not go to worlds. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that happened to you once or twice? Just once. Okay. Well. For me. Uh, it happened twice for other girls Jamie, on the team. Jamie, I mean, to be, let's be fair here. <laughs> You're Hi, gonna, my name is Jamie. <laughs> you're gonna have lots of you're gonna have lots of opportunities. Like I feel more bad for like Brady Clark, who's like yeah. not in the high performance program and won. Right? And it was like you're not even It's the you're not that's even the close. worst I, I know it's uh, tough. It's a tough time. Terrible feeling. It is like it ha- would have to be. I think if you're peaking at the right time. But you still enjoyed the national win, obviously. Yes, because we got into the Champions Cup, which so was a lot of fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And now you're in the slams. Yeah. You just got to get into one. Then you're in all of them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's totally Qualify great. Qualify here and there, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exa- <laughs> well, yeah, obviously. But uh, okay, well, let's talk, uh, let's talk about hardship. We're on, since we're on the subject, okay. you know, we're warming you up. Um, you lost the Olympic trials. Yeah. I had Chelsea Carey on the program. She <laughs> she was not the one who cried, by the way. Okay. Uh, so she said that I asked her about the the sort of proverb, I guess that it's be- you'd rather come last than second. Eh, True. No. No. You'd rather come second. Well, yeah. Okay. Because then you're like, oh, I want to go back. I was so close. If I came last, I would have been like, what the? I'm done. <laughs> yeah. So you you would have quit if you came last? Well, I, I would have I mean, I guess there was only, was there was only three teams. Three teams. So. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit different, I guess. Yeah. No, I wouldn't have quit. But uh, I think that being so close, I... Yeah. Because I guess in your case, it wouldn't be so much that you came second, but that it was like every game was on yeah. last rock. Yeah. Was... Yeah. 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 And so yeah. you would have rather it been that than just getting your ass kicked. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And so... Did you watch any of the Olympics? Did I watch the? I had to, I commentated the Olympics. Oh right, okay. <laughs> I wow. wasn't. I was honestly. I was fully planning on hibernating, like not yes. doing anything, yeah. just going blackout. Um, but then I got asked to commentate, and I was like, "Well, that's a good opportunity." Yay! So you did it. <laughs> so I did it. Okay. I. You're right. I did know that. That was a fault, faulty amount of research by me, but so you had to watch it. So, so I, was I that, watched okay. a lot of the so Olympics. So rephrase. Was it difficult to do that? It was very difficult um especially like the first game that I had to do because i was still pretty bitter it's a pretty fresh wound to be honest. Only been like six weeks or a month <laughs> not even not, not even. even yeah yeah a month. um yeah so i was i was pretty salty for the first game but um thankfully i was distracted by commentating like i had a lot to th- it was hard there's a lot to think about yeah uh it was my first time ever commentating so i was i was distracted with trying to be good at that that i i wasn't so much thinking oh i wish i was there so that helped yeah well you were there (laughs) yeah (laughs) i mean like oh i wish i was on the ice kind of thing so yeah yeah do you um because i know in the like obviously in canada you lose it's everyone knows it's a tough it's a tough thing to lose because then everybody's asking you about it and whatever. Yeah. Is that the same so in the keep States? bringing or up a breakup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, that breakup you went through seven yeah. months ago, I, how, have a how different, are you feeling? I have a different podcast than the other podcasts you're already on. So I want you to talk about it on mine, I please. Wait. I can't wait. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, but it, like, is that something that, uh, what was even my question? I don't know. I had a question so and then we started talking and then I, now I'm like, oh, what was even the question? You're, I'm just, I'm on a very small amount of sleep. I got in here at 1 a.m. Oh, and I didn't get to sleep till four because I'm Pacific time zone. Of course. Anyway, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep You're up doing with good. it here. Doing oh, well. Thank you. Oh yes. In Canada, everybody is talking to you like, you know, oh God, this sucks. Like that's mm-hmm. going to be so rough to lose. It is the same thing in the States or was it a little bit less pronounced? Was there a little bit more kind of like you had your own space to like grieve about it? Um, yeah, I would say, well, actually, uh, after we lost, I went to visit my parents in Canada. So I totally got away from <laughs> it all. Yeah. I literally was hibernating at my parents' place. Um, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. I don't think there was, um, there wasn't that many people asking about it. Um, so I got by. <laughs> yeah. I heard on another podcast that you that you think you're over it. I am. You feel good now. Yeah, definitely. I think at the time it was honestly the worst feeling in the world. Of course. Uh, but looking back, yeah, I, I, I don't want to just go to the Olympics to just go to the Olympics. I think that at the time I thought I was ready to do well at the Olympics. But looking back, I needed more experience. I needed more pressure training. Um, I needed to be more prepared, but I 
I, I didn't realize in what well, way. Well, of course, the Olympics isn't right in front of you. So, of course, you yeah. want it. You're never going to have that perspective. Yeah. Okay, so this is a great lead into my next question. And it's written down. This is a true, like, it's almost this like you set me out. up. <laughs> it's like you set me up for this perfect question. But so, yeah, so knowing what you know now, you're yeah. going to have a full quadrennial, yeah. probably with the same team. Mm-hmm. Or at least I assume yeah. that's the plan and maybe yeah. the same coach and everything. What are the things that you're going to do differently this quadrennial that maybe you didn't do last quad? It's honestly pretty similar preparation uh, as far as having the team on the same page, uh, doing a lot of our training together on and off the ice. Um, I think the biggest thing that we needed to to do was get experience. Like last year was my first world championship. I needed to play in that before I can go and do well at an Olympics, right? So For sure. we need uh, we need to position ourselves so that we can compete at world. Uh, like a few world championships before the next Olympic cycle. Um, you know, trying to make it as deep into the slam uh, playoffs as we can to to get that pressure training and uh, to play on that stage because it's pretty similar uh, to a world's or, or or what I think would a, an Olympic trials would be and stuff. So, um, yeah, I think mostly it's just, um, it's the similar training that we did in the last quad, but it's more of the experience that we need in this next quad. Right, because you're still very young. 26 Mm -hmm. right yeah so yeah i mean there's lots to come lots to happen (laughs) uh okay we're almost done here a couple more questions for you i know i was talking with brendan botcher uh i brought him up already but i was talking with him and he was talking about how this year for the olympic trials he took the year off of work and it was like Mm -hmm. a very different feeling for him what was the adjustment to being a full-time curler like for you because it's awesome I, uh, yeah you liked it you, you had no issue you're like this is great Live, literally it. living the dream yeah. like you get up in the morning you go to the gym you go to the practice and then you know have some kind of meeting or admin work and then you go back to practice and then you're like yeah that's cool. it good day at the office done day yeah and so did you did you have any trouble adjusting to that at all or you were just like no this is perfect i i got my routine down and everything's good yeah um no i no trouble adjusting to it i loved it uh it, after a while like you you kind of go through a little bit of a slump because of just the repetition and yeah. um yeah that's what i would imagine just, would be the toughest part because if you yeah. go from practicing two or three times a week to yeah. two or three times a day that's a big adjustment yeah so you just you yeah so i kind of went through that but then you just got to figure out a way to you know keep it interesting mix it up a little bit um do different kind of uh workouts or practices um but yeah, no, I I was I was living the dream. I loved it. You're all about it. Yeah. You're living it. Yeah. You're loving it. So being a full-time curler, does that make the... Because I haven't really had a full-time curler on the show yet. Does that make the wins and losses... <laughs> Because that's your paycheck. You're like, oh my gosh. (laughs) Well, not even necessarily the money part of it, but I just feel like if curling's your only thing yeah, and you lose... yeah. Like even in a week, like say you have a sh- uh, a bad slam, you go yeah. zero and four, and, yeah. you, and you're like, oh, why am I doing this? Yeah, like yeah. Is, does that make it harder? Does it make the wins and losses feel like more? Um, probably. I've never been on the other side of the spectrum. I guess. Um, yeah. So I don't. I don't super know, but um, yeah, I would say that you you definitely. I don't know. Personally, I feel like I would analyze it more being a full time curler because, um, like you said, it, it is everything everything that you do um but uh not to the extent where it's like do or die like i need this right. in order you know so but hopefully the, you got a good <laughs> happy medium going. yeah you have to have uh, i think so uh okay last thing we're gonna finish on analytics because okay. uh i know you're i know you're an analytics person <laughs> team yeah. yeah uh so like I, I heard, I think I read this. I don't think I heard it. That part of your training day is to just analyze stats. So I'm not saying that, you know, you have to give me the proprietary info <laughs> or whatever, but how do you think that that has helped you? Like knowing stat, like, okay, first of all, what stats are you looking at? So like when you say I'm studying stats for an hour every day, you well, I to- am not studying stats for an hour every day. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I read that in an interview. You're like, it's because it was like, what was your typical day look like? And you included oh. that. In, but that might be like weird. No, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're not doing it an hour every day. You're not. A, I'm not saying you're no. like a nerd, Jamie. No. Well, I mean, probably uh, like 
for two or three days leading up to a big event, I would definitely be analyzing gotcha. like other teams stats and figuring out our own like strength and weaknesses. Um, after every event, I, I analyze it, see how we did in that event, um, see how we're trending over the season, um, figuring out, you know, spots that we need to work on. So um, you're looking mostly at mostly like efficiency numbers and stuff. Gotcha. So you're looking at a, for your opponents, you're looking at like tendencies for in, in every way. Like if they're, uh, not very good at getting their deuce with a hammer like we'll try to exploit that in some way and tendencies also in um like if if one thrower can't throw an intern down the center line you know we'll try to force her into to doing that so looking at any kind of tendencies that they have in efficiency numbers and shooting and and just trying to exploit it have you had moments where you got caught up like, sure. is that part of the part of the learning process with analytics That's exactly. is you're like, you're like, okay, we know that she's not very good at interns down the center line. And then you just try so hard for that. And then all yeah. of a sudden you give up. A and four. then you're like, shit, I got to actually remove the rocks from play too. Damn yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. That was part of the learning curve. Um, I'm a, I'm a big nerd for the analytics and I really enjoy it. So uh, I, I do find that I need to kind of, um, you can't overthink it. You overanalyze it and then you just shoot yourself in the foot. So um, I, I do enjoy going through it all. But then, you know, once it's game time, it's just all that information's in the back of my mind. Um, I don't need to, to bring it to the forefront. I just worry about what I'm used to doing on the ice. And how do you put that into practice for your own team? So like when you talk about efficiency and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So if you notice over the course of a couple tournaments that you're not very good at stealing, maybe right. you were, you know, like how do you, how it's do you put that very into practice? Accurate example? Yeah. Oh, okay. So in practice, we would Listen, be like, I do a ton of research for this. <laughs> in I brought practice, Kleenex. That exact ready for situation <laughs> happened. Um, and we're like, we need to be more comfortable with rocks and play and figure out how to steal. So, um, you know, just, um, First of all, having a meeting, just sitting down and, and discussing, like, why can't we steal? Um, figuring out how we're feeling with a bunch of rocks in play and then going out on the ice and practicing different scenarios of um, how would we set up the ideal steal? What what kind of strategy calls are we comfortable with and how can we execute them, basically? So is that a lot of, like, scenario work and yeah. practice? Or, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, throwing up d- double centers um, and playing out the end, see if it works, and then throwing up one center and a bunch of freezes, playing out the end, see how it works. Yeah, because I, I think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like with the five rock rule, th- it makes the analytics more more of a thing. Yeah, I agree. And um, yeah, uh, we only really started this whole analytics thing with uh, the five rock rule. Like last couple years in the slams, that's when we started thinking about it. Right. And then this year for the whole season because of five rock, I think it made a, a big difference. Oh, I, I see it for yeah. sure. You know, in my old uh, Tuesday night men's league. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm a little above that. Okay, listeners. <laughs> thank you. Don't curl in Tuesday night men's. But but yes, I agree. Like five rock rule. That's where it yeah. starts to really take in. And you and you also have all the numbers from the slams. Mm-hmm. So I think that that makes a big difference. Right, the information is there. Right? The information is there. Just need to go get it. So ha- has it been like a notable improvement? for your for you for your team do you do you see a I noticeable think improvement so. yeah. i think so um i think the biggest thing is that i've really enjoyed with analyzing the the opposition um we have more specific game plans going into each game specific a, on like how we're doing as a team and who we're playing uh so as a skip that's made me a lot more confident in the style of game that i'm gonna call for that specific team right so i think that's made a huge difference and then i think just in in the overall growth of our team, I think we've taken um, some big steps because we're not just going to events, doing the same thing and hoping for different results. We're going to events, we're analyzing how we did in the last one and we're like consciously trying to improve on certain areas, like being more specific with our actions. And I think that that's helping us develop and grow as a team faster than we would without yeah i think that makes a ton of sense because you have the specific things that you're going to work on where do you see where do you see the analytics going because i feel like it is a pretty new thing i think Mm -hmm. people are saying like oh this is this is curling's money ball moment or whatever and now it's like every baseball team at most professional sports teams oh yeah are trying to get that advantage to the point where it's like there almost isn't an advantage anymore where do you see the analytics going for curling well i think similar to what you just said i think right now it's a big advantage because i don't think a whole lot of teams are doing it hell no so right now it's it's quite large um but i think as i think 
I think all the teams are going to get on board to some degree, and I think it's going to you know bring us a little bit closer, and then it's going to be harder to find those areas to exploit because we're going to know all the information about them. They're going to know all the information about us. Sure. So you can only do so much. I think it's going to get a little bit more difficult, but um, I think it's it's definitely the way um, – it's we're on the right path, just like any other sport. Analytics are part of it, and I think curling needs to incorporate it. Well, I know that was the big thing with fitness, right? Mm-hmm. It was like uh, for a while that was the gap. Right. It was like right. some teams were really fit, and yeah, other exactly. teams were not. This and is the new. Thing. So you think that's the new the 100%. new fitness? If yep. teams aren't like uh, I interviewed Brad Jacobs after he won the Olympics, and yep. he said that if if you're not in the gym, yep. then you may as well quit yep. curling. Do you feel like that's what it should be or is going to be for stats? And if you're not looking at the stats, you may as well just. I think play. so. And I think that I don't think it's like everybody on the team needs to be like diving deep into the books. I right. don't think that, but I think probably the skip and probably like somebody on the coaching staff doing most of the dirty work and then, you know, kind of summarizing for the other players. On I don't think it needs to be everybody on the team, but I think the team as a whole needs to be doing it. And so that's a thing that you're, is that part of your development too, is trying to figure out like what, which stats are good for yeah. you and which ones are bad and kind of making it all sort it's, of. Yeah. Yeah. You got to figure it out. It's a science. It's a process. Um, like uh, some people on the team, um, they're just not analytical at all. So if sure. you give them all this information, they'll just like look at you like a deer in headlights, yeah. right? So um, yeah. you got to figure out what ev- <laughs> what everybody needs and uh, how to present that information to them because it's not going to be the same for everybody on the team. So uh, it's interesting. It is interesting. I know nothing about it. I'm yeah. going to be retired. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't good to begin with. And then once I retire, none of this is going to matter to me. So it's good to get. I like to hear about it. And I know that definitely like casual curling fans, they... They have no idea no. and they don't need to know, exactly. but it's just yeah. like, it's, I, I do think there are people that want to hear about yeah. it. So that's, that's fascinating. Okay. It's been over an hour. We can wrap it okay. up. <laughs> uh, this is a, a chance for you. Plug away, plug your sponsors, your social media, whatever, uh, whatever you want. Yeah. Well, where follow, can people find you? Follow the team. It's uh, team Jay Sinclair on every social media platform and shout out to our prime sponsor, Dave Estee Vineyards in North Carolina. Oh, you are just like, you're yeah. in North Carolina. You're want some in good, there. If you want some good wine. There that, you go. And that, beer. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't drink, but the curling club sounds cool. Maybe I'll, <laughs> it is. Maybe oh, I'll come down. It is. It's so nice. The warm room is huge. Yeah? Yeah, it's okay. an awesome curling club. All right. Club. I'll come down to Charlotte. There you you, go. I'll curl up with Jamie. <laughs> sounds inappropriate. Uh, I got, it was one of those where it started to come out of my mouth and, and you, I was like, well, you were committed. You were I was committed. committed. Uh, thank you for doing this. <laughs> and, um, you know. Good luck. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening to another edition of Stone and Straw. And I got to tell you, if you like the show, tell your friends about it. Spread the word. I've had a lot of really cool conversations with people who have said that they, you know, have told their club curlers about it. There's been some talk over drinks after games about the episodes. And I love hearing that kind of stuff. And if you're enjoying the show, don't keep it to yourself. Tell your friends. We're The downloads have been excellent. The numbers have been great. And it's been really fun to do this show. And I just really want more, as many people to know about it as possible. I think our episode last week with Nicholas Sedin was so great. And it's doing super well. And people are sharing it around, which is so awesome. And obviously, this episode with Jamie Sinclair, fantastic as well. So please tell your friends, rate and review the show on iTunes, tweet about it. Uh, If you're enjoying the show, even just send me a tweet at Stone Straw Pod at Cullen the Curler. Tell me how you're enjoying the show. Hey, maybe you hate the show and you want to tell me about that because people definitely have also told me that. They tell me that they don't like the show or me or my comedy or anything. So, I mean, hey, if you're one of those people and you really got something to get off your chest, you know where to find me. Uh, This episode, as always, brought to you by Curling Zone, Dynasty Curling, Hardline Curling. Next week, Oh boy, we got a good one. And much in the same way, I got a lot of requests for an American guest. I also got a lot of requests to have more non-skips on the show. And I'm a lead, trust me. I want to get as many front-end players on this show and thirds on this show as I can. And so... We had Mark Kennedy on the show, famous second and third. We've we've had John Morris on the show who's played third for a lot of his career. So I am trying to get people on the show that aren't just skips. But next week, 
I'm very excited. Or two weeks from now, I should say, I'm very excited because we're going to have our first lead on the show. Craig Savile joins the Stone and Straw podcast. And my goodness, what a chat it was. We go through his whole career from playing with John Morris to playing with Glenn Howard to his cancer diagnosis, all that stuff. I mean, it is... It was such a phenomenal episode, and I know you guys are going to absolutely love that one. So make sure you come back here next week for the Craig Savile episode of Stone and Straw. I'm John Cullen. Follow us on Twitter at Stone Straw Pod. If you like the show, tell your friends, rate and review it on iTunes, and we'll see you back here in two weeks. <laughs>